Thanks, everyone. I'll try and work this in my best way I can. Um, so, I'm going to show quite a few slides, and for some of them, I'm not really going to say much about them because what I want to do is give them to Will to give to you afterwards so that you know, you've not really come here to read, you've come here to listen to people talk. So, that's my disclaimer, really, that there are a lot of slides. Some of them I'll just whiz through. And some of them, having sat at the back, I know you won't be able to see at the back anyway. So, um, so my name is Richard Singer, clinical psychologist. Um, I'm going to talk, I suppose, about something about kind of what I do and my job. But um, I, I think probably more interesting and relevant stuff is kind of why I do it and what I think people working in psychology more widely than that, not just into schools, might pick up from what I do. Okay, so that's my intention today. Um, so the background to what I do, I guess, is um, there's, a, there's endless policy documents that, that say um, frontline non-mental health staff sh should receive training in mental health issues, particularly staff working with children. So there's, there's, there's a strong kind of emphasis towards um, workforce development, basically, for people who are working generally in professional roles with children to understand what mental health is. Um, and particular research around schools and, and teachers kind of shows teachers really want this. Um, they don't feel confident in understanding young people's emotional health, mental health generally. Um, but at the same time, children often use teachers or school staff as their first port of call, as their first point of contact to say, talk about what's happening for them, talk about how they're feeling. Or... They are, teachers are the people who notice that something has changed or something is different, okay, and yet they feel they don't really have the, that, that kind of confidence and understanding to do something about it. Um, coupled with that, you know, I've, having had sort of 12 or 13 years experience working in CAM services, I don't think I met one child who said, you know, it was me who really wanted to come today. You know, I made this happen. Um, and often it was the opposite. It was children, I don't want to be here. And... Um, I really want to make this as short and painless as possible and I can go away again. Okay, so, and I'll come on to that theme uh, uh, quite a lot later. Um, coupled with that, I suppose, you know, as a society, we see schools as, you know, not, I see schools quite differently, I think, from what policy says schools are, but policy says schools are ways for children to learn and be assessed and show their knowledge. And what research in this area kind of shows is um, teachers who are happy... Um, help children be happy and those children achieve better and everyone's happy. So that makes me go back to well, what school stress around and a big stressor for teachers is unhappy, stressed, distressed children and not knowing what to do about it. So if we start there and change, try and change something about that then my theory is then we'll have a, we'll, there will be a, a kind of a, a knock-on effect in lots of ways. Okay. And having worked, I suppose, in CAM services, liaised with schools for a long time, the sense I got from that is, if we talk to schools about, well, what, what do you want to schools that will make the mental health system work better? Often people say, we just want more of what we've got, we want more CAMs. And what that means is, you know, we want people to be seen quicker, um, we want less restrictive criteria for how people get a service, we want you to stick with families even if they don't come. Um, we want CAMS workers to see children in schools. Um, we don't want you to tell us they've got a diagnosis. We want you to tell us um, what's, what's going on for them. Okay. And I suppose often that made me think, well, this idea of more CAMS contains a lot of assumptions that I don't really agree with. You know, first of all, that, that people who are distressed need specialist input. You know, that if we had a hundred times more psychologists that would there would be less demand that young people want to see someone like us um, and that we can treat mental health difficulties by taking people away from their or not not look at their whole situation and look at say just talk to parents about what's going on for that young person okay and that made me think in my life working camps well what would clinical psychology be if we actually said um, none of those assumptions about more about more CAMs are true. You know, it might look quite different. And that's, I guess that's what started me down a process of trying to involve myself in this area, um, which ultimately led to 
somebody paying for me to do some work in this area. So what is it? We are, I am Lancashire he Emotional Health in Schools, which is myself and other clinical psychology colleagues um, delivering training and consultation into high schools in Lancashire for, for various not very interesting um, reasons in terms of funding. It's high schools only, which I kind of think is probably you know, not, not the focus I would have chosen, but that is the focus. Um, and we have one remit really, which is it's workforce development for staff, for any staff working in schools, um, based on training and supervision or consultation. We're a public health intervention, so we're funded by public health from Lancashire County Council, and the, the money is there in the long run to improve the health of all children. And um, you know what people would like to see in as a as a a long outcome of that really is um, less reliance on specialist services, less referrals into specialist services, more early support for people um, at the time that they need it. Okay. And when I talk to schools, I say, you know, this is what you, this is what's on offer. What do you want? Then they say, and I'll read these out because people probably can't see them. They say they want this. They want to know how do we make sense of mental health, because because we've understood it as something that you guys do over there. We don't really know what it is, and we, actually we haven't needed to, because we can make referrals into CAMS. How can we make sense of mental health? When do we need someone else, and what, when can we do something ourselves? Um, and if we are doing some support ourselves, what could it be realistically? No one's got any spare capacity in terms of time in schools. So people can't necessarily say, right, well, I'll, I'll learn how to do a clinical session, or even have 10 minutes with a young person. It's what can we do given what we do? Okay. So they want, they would like a lot, but actually the reality is they can't do a lot. Differ they can't do a lot in terms of time. So that brings me back to what can people do in the time that they've got that is that speaks to these aims. Okay. And so Part of what I do, and part of the, I guess the, the idea in the service is, we, we select schools or schools self-select on the basis that they're kind of ready to accept this and ready to move on and ready to do something, as opposed to trying to break down the barriers of people not thinking mental health is their business. And I think that's the weakness actually of the service. I'd like more resources to do, to to challenge some. Um, settings that don't think they need to do anything different, but we are where we are. So I see our aims as developmental rather than transformative, you know, try to develop people rather than change. Each school will have a plan that says these are our aims, these are what we would like to get to through the work with, with us. Okay, you won't read that, but um, essentially what we do is skills-based training, topic-based training. What I mean by those two things is, you know, some is how do we understand something called anxiety in, in the young people coming to school? What does that mean? And a skills-based thing might be, what could we do in the time we've got that might help um, that young person? Okay. And the aims really are then, you know, staff feel more knowledgeable, feel more skilled, and pupils get support quicker where they are with the people that they know. Okay. And the, the model, I guess, I think about and I've used in setting the service up is um, a framework around public health workforce development, okay, which, which is, I guess it's a model that I can then refer back to when people say, well, yeah, well, why do you do what, why do you do it how you do it? Well, I do it because this is what policy or good practice says um, works in terms of developing frontline workforce. So what I think, what I try and do is help people understand young people's needs, understand mental health, and that allow young people to access something where they don't, ha you know, they don't have a referral criteria, they don't have to go somewhere else, they can talk to the people that they know. Um, and that mental health is understood as well-being and coping and resilience. Okay, and so the, the aims of what the staff want to do is to improve well-being, coping, resilience, as opposed to thinking about necessarily problem solving. 
this bit here, reduce health inequalities, I think is that for me that's the key driver and that's that's kind of why I do what I do because um, I suppose in my time working in Camden, one of the things that I kept coming back to in my head was why are we seeing who we're seeing and why are we not seeing all these other people? So, there's, there's, for, so as an example, you know, there's lots of evidence, lots of local evidence in the Camden service I worked in that certain minor, minority groups were not represented in Camden. And we used to kind of talk about that and acknowledge that and think, yeah, but what can we do about it? Okay, so we, in a sense, we accepted it. We kind of said, yeah, we're kind of seeing these groups, not those groups. Isn't it a shame? Um, and essentially what I think that did is that increases health inequalities. That kind of says services set up to serve some people and not others, and it's kind of too hard to do anything about. Now, talking locally in the services I, were in, I was in, schools see everyone. Everyone's at school, okay? And in some of the schools I work with, what we might call minority groups are the majority groups. So I definitely see us as needing to think about working where people are at and where people are. And, you know, I think in the 10 years or so working in schools, I've kind of come to a very different relationship with the idea of um, hard to reach, that, you know, we're hard to reach, essentially, not, not our clients, not the people who um, would benefit from psychology. Um, we need to make ourselves easier to reach. Okay, again, I don't want to necessarily read all of these words, but what I promote to schools is a kind of a stepped care approach that kind of say, and the important thing I suppose in this is, is not that all I will do is work at a higher step and work with the people who think they've got a responsibility for young people's well-being. It's supposed to be for everyone. So coming into a school... Um, one of the, I guess, the things I insist on is I want to talk to everybody. You know, I want to start with everybody and everybody see me and listen to someone talking about mental health and listen to um, someone talking about mental health in a way that is non-diagnostic, non-pathologising, is about well-being as opposed to categories of problems. Okay, they can decide to agree or disagree with that, but the, but. For me, that is, it's, that's an essential, which is my step one. And after that, I'll move up to thinking about people who have more specific responsibilities. And I was thinking, so what, how do I describe what I think is good about my service? And bizarrely, the way my brain works, um, I, think, I think I probably saw something on telly one night and thinking, Gordon Ramsay, when he comes into a restaurant, he just says the same things. He kind of he says... You know, your food's rubbish. You, you're doing too many different dishes and you don't have the skill to cook them and you're not looking after your, your customers. And somehow, in my head, that made me think, well, those, those are the strengths of what I think we try and do. Um, we try and work on psychology, psychological skills, and uh, evidence-based work, um, but actually not too much of that and some key principles and foundations that are probably people who listen to me talk probably feel, yeah, you, you've talked about this before, you know, and deliberately repetitive in some ways because it's about not trying to do too many things but to do a small number of things well and ha really hammer them home. Okay, so my foundations are to talk about a small number of therapy approaches so I feed in um, some CBT principles, some solution-focused principles, but really nothing else, because I think that's kind of enough. Everything, for me, that I talk about comes back to attachment as well, that attachment and relationships are absolutely key, and if people take nothing else, then they take that. Um, but alongside that, I suppose some ideas of what to do with that around empathy, listening, communication skills. And something I'd, I suppose... I don't, might not use the term mentalising with, with teachers, but something I also bring in is this idea that um, they can have an, not empathy and listening is not just a passive process, that they can do something active with that to let people know, you've been heard, you, we, I'm, I'm trying to understand you. I might not be able to solve these problems or change these problems, but what I can give you is a sense that you've been listened to and understood. 
and something else to bring in, I suppose is, is and I'm no expert around neuropsychology, but, but some sense of what you see, what, how people react, represents something going on for them in their brains as well. These aren't necessarily always conscious, deliberate choices that people are making. Um, and bringing that back to things like attachment, you know, people find helpful, to, again, to aid their understanding of how do I make sense of what this young person is doing or saying to me. Okay, so some example topics. These. Understanding young people's mental health, assessment and formulation, so t training people in basic screening measures, evaluation measures, which, you know, for us might feel like these are second nature, They're, it's a whole new world for some people. Um, attachment, communication skills, etc. Okay, quickly, I suppose, I don't just do training. I, what I don't really believe in is coming into a setting, say, here you are, here's your two hours of training, goodbye. You know, you are now trained. Um, and the theory doesn't back that up as well. You know, theory would say, we learn skills by, you know, we, we're interested and we're able to listen. Um, the training needs to be of good quality. But there's something else, which is that environment needs to support change. The environment needs to be willing to accept this new idea, and there needs to be ongoing support for that change. So I talk to people a lot about this reflective practice cycle, and saying, you know, you can... I can do this bit, the learning and training, but actually for something to change, we, we need to move around this cycle. People need to have something that they can put into action and we need to come back and talk about it and think about, so how did it go? You know, did it work? Did it, were you able to try it? Do we need to, what do we need to tweak in this? So a key element is consultation and support with, can be with anybody, but it's often with um, key people with responsibilities in the schools, which are anonymised discussions around individuals or groups about trying to make sense, for them to make sense of, what, why do I see what I see? Why do I see these things? Um, I might, and that's not about getting to an answer. I suppose it's about moving people's knowledge on um, from... Um, ideas like this, you know, well, of course they're like that, because, you know, I taught their mum and dad and they were a, a nightmare, or, um, you know, she's lazy or manipulative, um, they've got a diagnosis of ADHD, so no wonder, you know, or one I've heard recently, you know, so they've got an attachment disorder, I, I don't know what that means, but apparently, you know, that's what we have, that's what we have to think about, um, you know, those don't, in my experience, those don't help people. They don't help people help the young people. So what I'd like in an ideal world, or when the work goes well, what I'd like is to use a formulation approach to help people think, OK, if I understand attachment theory, can that help me understand why I have this relationship with this young person or why these things happen in, in between them and other people? If I know something about this young, this child's early history, does that tell me anything about how their, um, their brain may have developed, their, how their attention is, or their concentration, or their ability to tolerate distress or uncertainty? Um, can I understand how this young person might be seeing threat in this environment, and how that might be affecting their behaviour, and how that, their threat might not be my threat? Okay, so the, the key theme is psychological theory into practice. It's to think about a, a few s limited psychological ideas that make sense for people in school and that will help them make sense of their peoples. So I'm just going to throw a few things on the slides, such as, you know, I use a, a five P's type form in consultation and encourage people to take that away, to think about linking people's experiences with their current presentation. So really asking, that, asking people to ask that question, you know, what's happened to you as opposed to what's wrong with you? To think about needs, not problems. So lots of teachers come across Maslow's hierarchy, and so I talk about it all the time, because I think, firstly, school can do all of that. Schools can meet all of those needs for young people. And, um, and I, don't, so I, and I don't want to talk about problems, I want to talk about unmet needs. So what, 
people see as behaviour, to me, is it's unmet needs. If school can meet all those needs, how can you do it? Um, we talk about resilience, partly because it's everywhere in schools, and yet actually nobody understands it. So, um, and I'm not saying I understand it better than them, and so I can help them with that, but to simplify this idea of resilience into there are some things that theory says help resilience. Again, these are in school. Friendships, education, a sense of security, potentially developing talents and interests. All this is, the opportunities for this are all there if people can identify them and see beyond this is a child with a problem, with a difficult history. Um, and again, things like theory and formulation simplify it down into something that people can use in the moment. So this is something I use with teachers around attachment. You know, rather than trying to do a complicated formulation, these are some questions people can ask themselves when they're struggling to understand something that's going on. It's say in a, a difficult um, interaction in a classroom scenario. You know, what's, that, what's that young person seeing in terms of threat? And how's that behaviour about trying trying to reduce that threat for them. You know, if they're refusing to do something, if they're walking out, can we see that through an attachment lens? And how will this help us then get to what are they needing? And how can I tell them that I'm understanding them? How can I tell them, let them know they've been, on the, we're, and we're trying to understand them? Okay. How can we explain the brain in a simplistic way or in a way that helps young people make, make sense of themselves you know how can we understand help them see okay so I've got a you know any neuropsychologist in the audience don't judge me um, <laughs> but you know how can we understand there's a there's a downstairs old brain that we can't really control very well and there's an upstairs thinking brain and how can we get that brain into action to help understand you know anxiety or attachment or threat or anger this before you know how can how can we try and communicate our understanding you know we can try, we can we can be em empathic and try to understand but what will move that on is letting people know I'm, I'm trying to I might be getting this wrong but I'm just wondering is this what's going on for you you know again this doesn't need an hour-long boundary session these can be things that can be done in the moment that can help people feel okay you've got me in mind here And practical things like this, you know, that people can just have a go at. We could all have a go at. Um, around, you know, anxiety first aid. You know, the number of teachers I've come across who've said, you know, every day I'm dealing, I'm talking to someone about a panic attack, I'm dealing with a panic attack, I'm dealing with several, uh, you know, every break time. But people want something that's just there for them to use, but that makes sense to them and has a background to it. And... So, and that's, I guess that's where I wanted to come on to, if I've got, I can't remember how much time I've got. Um, does it work? Well, somehow, in preparing this, I came up with two um, plant-based metaphors. Um, one was that, um, some ta like, I don't know, I don't know if mushrooms work like this, but this is in my head, <laughs> that um, there's something going on under the ground, under the surface, and things pop up at unexpected times that kind of look a bit like, that's me, the big mushroom, but aren't necessarily just the same. Um, and I've had lots of experiences like that where, you know, I might have, say, done a session on evaluation and talked about things like the SDQ and other screening measures. I've come back in a couple of months and, and people have said, you know, for, you know, like you were saying to me, you know, we, we've revised our assessment, our um, admission schedule, and now all the children we do an SDQ with. And I'm thinking, I didn't tell you to do that. Um, but something's gone on under here, and it's popped up again. Which I guess you could call systemic working. Um, but So I think it works, but it might not work. It doesn't work in a sense that people are doing what I tell them to do. And this brings me on to my next plant-based metaphor, which is... Um, you know, if you take, well, this is my understanding again, biologists <laughs> contradict me, if you take a seed out of an apple and plant it in the ground, it grows an apple tree, but the apples are different to the apple that you took it from. 
the brute's still an apple. And I think, well, that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping to do, that people are still growing apples. Um, and I guess for me, the, the, the maybe controversial bit in that is um, what I the holy grail in, um, you know, if you read research and practice into education and mental health, is kind of standardisation. You know, there's, there was, there's lots of stuff around the, um, you know, the evaluation of Sure Start and targeting mental health in schools and SEAL that kind of says, well, it didn't work as well as we wanted it to work. And the conclusion is often um, because people were doing their own thing. And actually, I don't, I, the, you know, I'm, I'll own this for myself. I don't really believe that. I think that the difficulty or, the, or what I've come across is people kind of know what they're told to do, but they don't understand why they're doing it. And if, they don't, if you don't have that foundation of this is why I'm doing it like this, then you will kind of go off piste and do it a bit different because you, maybe you don't feel comfortable with it. So for me, it's not about everyone being a golden delicious. You know, people need to be allowed to be their own apples um, as long as they're apples. And that takes me back to, you know, those key foundations that if someone... And again, this is my experience, if someone gets attachment theory and understands that, then in my experience, people's application of that is often very similar to what I might have told them, encouraged them or advised them to do anyway. Because it's the application of common sense. But without that common sense foundation, you know, people might think, well, you're telling me to be, you know, to be consistent, but, uh, but you know, there's lots of problems with that. Or you tell me to do this, but I just don't have time to do that. That makes sense. Okay, so, right, apples. If you remember nothing else. So, what do I take from this? Schools really want this. They've been really hungry for new ideas. But it's not been all plain sailing. Okay, one is kind of culture clash around, well, what's training? Experience of training in schools, from what I've heard, is, you know, this is a new curriculum, this is how you teach it, bang, go and do it. And my, my training has been really different, which is, this is some ideas about how to think, not do. So there have been issues around, you know, but where are my strategies? And I've been saying, well, they'll come, you know, I trust it, it'll happen. Um, and within that, I think what's really helped me is to think about issues around safety and certainty. So people may have come across this model before. Um, when I kind of start with a school, often where people want to get is here. They want to get to safe certainty. I want to feel certain about what I'm doing and safe in that knowledge. And where I want them to get to is here, safe uncertainty. I've n I really don't know what I'm doing, but I'm safe that I'll do the right thing. Okay. And what, where people's starting position is, is often down here. It's either we've got this workbook or this, these, um, this, package, what do you think, we, we're trying it but it doesn't really work and that's kind of, you know, it's the, the certain that this is the thing to do but it's not working or unsafe uncertainty which is, um, we can't talk to them about that because I'll just open up the can of worms and I won't know how to close it again okay, so again, back to foundations which is, if we understand or if, if, if we can help other people understand the foundations you know, they can be uncertain, but safe in the knowledge that the, these things tend to work. My experience of commissioners, um, you know, they're, they're people with a mission, in my experience, people um, committed to helping change and improve, but they don't know how to do it. And I guess what I've learned is, um, you know, data, certainly for the people I've talked to, is much less important than being able to talk up a good game and tell stories about you know, this last week this happened. You know, people tend to listen to that. Data gets passed up the chain, but again, in my experience, actually, the evaluation skills I think we get trained in towards are very thin on the ground elsewhere. So I think that is a real that although data might might not know who who takes it and who listens to it, it's it's really important because not everyone else, not everyone can actually generate good data. Working in a public health way just feels really natural to me how schools see their work as um, 
as helping young people's mental health. And I feel like I'm not using any different skills working in a preventative or um, early intervention level. Okay, the, the uncomfortableness is sometimes being in that middle ground of not being camps and not being schools. And often representing, camp, feeling like I'm being asked to represent the, the difficulties in camps when actually I, I'm on their side. Um, and finally, what, I want, what do I want from all this? Well, you know, as well as kind of helping things locally, um, I'd like to think that one day we can change or can influence how teachers, school staff are trained. Again, not about strategies, just about psychology and understanding the psychology of young people, as well as something more specialised for settings where children are very complex or have very complex histories. You know, and through that, developing a model that can be replicated and promoting this idea that there isn't the tiers in the mental health service to still work. You know, saying this person is at this tier and so they're not eligible for that tier. It, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't meet people's needs. Okay. So, I'm more or less done. Here's some things people said, if you can read them. Um, you know, this last quote is a key one to me someone who's been teaching 10 years and never had any training in mental health, no initial training, no in-service training, and yet they're seeing all of our children. Mm. All of the children we will see in CAMS are going to school. You know, who, who is thinking about their mental health? Okay. If you're interested in learning more, some contact details. Um, thank you.